I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this episode of the Black Tramone Chronicles. I'm extremely excited because I get to talk to one of my favorite tromonists and people, my good brother, Andre Hayward. Andre, how you doing, man? Hey, Dion, how you doing, man? And Thanks for inv inviting me to do this. Man, I'm doing great. As, as long as you're in front of my face and I hear the words coming out your mouth, like life is better. So oh. thank, you, <laughs> man, thank you so much for coming on. For those of you that don't know Andre, he's just like not only one of my favorite trombonists, he's, he's a phenomenal person. He's a great educator. He's played with so many different people throughout his career. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. So uh, Andre, man, if you could start, uh, tell the people... How did you get into playing music and how did you find the trombone? Well, my first introduction to music was uh, through my family. Mm. Uh, actually, both my parents. Uh, uh, my mom is deceased, Barbara Hayward, rest her soul. Uh, my dad is still living, Melvin Hayward. Um, my father played uh, at my uncle's church uh, as minister of music for many years uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, my uncle pastor the church at a greater community missionary missionary Baptist church. And uh, that's where my father played or organ and piano. Um, in addition to that, um, his sisters and brothers, uncles and aunts, my uncles and aunts, uh, all had a group called the Hayward Singers. Oh. And uh, they were a gospel group back in the day. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, uh, my grandmother uh, was responsible for making sure that they, they would sing in the churches, the programs, <laughs> Etc. You know, they would travel to all of these churches. Yeah. Um, I remember as a kid listening to them rehearse in church. Mm. Uh, they would get together on Saturdays and, and rehearse rehearse songs. And uh, so that was my first introduction uh, to music was in the in the world of gospel music. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother also was a, was a wonderful singer. Um, my mom sang in the choir in church at, at, at my uncle's church as well, and she would sing around the house. You know, singing hymns. Uh, sure. things like that. So I learned, learned a lot of those songs by osmosis. Okay. And uh, just like any typical African-American family, we had records, uh, you know, almost seventies, eighties babies. So, you know, we had, okay. had a lot of the gospel records and uh, R and B, uh, you know, eight tracks were, were popular back in that day. <laughs> okay. Okay. I remember one eight, eight track, my dad kept Andre Crouch. It was an Andre Crouch uh, eight track in, in the car. Uh -huh. So we would listen to that every day as we were on the way to school. <laughs> man it's funny how those those things implant themselves in us before we even know it you know and how much that yeah. shapes us in the beginning yeah for sure for sure yeah yeah um yeah and well in addition to my dad's family side of the family my mom side of the family is musically inclined um you know my uncle her, uh, uncle don gill uh was a musician he he they, they all grew up in separate homes and foster homes, unfortunately. Uh, so my mom lived in Houston. My aunt Pat and Uncle Don lived in Beaumont. Uh, okay. So Uncle Don studied music at, at Lamar University uh, in Beaumont. And uh, he was a piano player, guitar player. Uh, he okay. was the one that really introduced me to jazz, jazz music. Okay. Okay. And what about the trombone? Did any of them, uh, did anybody play a brass instrument or like that in your family or were they mostly? Singing? Well, this is a, this is a latter story. Um, I, you know, I discovered, I, I, uh, got, um, uh, involved with the trombone due to my mom wanted me to join the band in, in middle school. Mm. Cause prior to that, I wasn't really even thinking about music. I, I'd always loved music. I grew up around music. And it was always fascinated when I, when the band would perform at schools, um, my elective was Spanish. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I wasn't, it wasn't even thinking along those lines. So, um, my mom, I guess she fe figured that the band being in a band would help me stay out of trouble. Sure. Uh, so that's, that's when I joined, I joined a band in sixth grade at Holland middle school. Okay. Um, at the time, uh, you know, we had had to choose instruments. I initially wanted to play saxophone. Okay. But the only two choices were the trumpet and trombone. And then I'm looking at this trombone with this slide and fascination and and mystique. There's a certain mystique about it, about this yeah. making music with this slide. So, so I chose I chose that. 
Wow. Wow. By yeah. choice. By choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, got at home, uh, started buzzing the mouthpiece. When I, I, I was uh, buzzing, I went in the closet and started buzzing. You know, mm -hmm. get, I got, got my first few notes out, out on the mouthpiece. And I think I even taught myself Mary had a little lamb the first day of having it. Wow. <laughs> so I knew, I, knew, I knew then that, I, you know, that this is a, you know, it's going to be a, a lifelong thing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did it feel pretty natural to you when you first started playing? Like, it, I mean, it it's, actually, it, it actually, seems instinctive. It actually, it actually did. You know, I mean, yeah. at first, you know, you know, you know, when you first uh, uh, pick up an instrument as, as a, brass, a young brass player, you get the tickles and the yeah. um, tinkle, tickles and tingles in your chops. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. other than after getting through that, it, was, it felt great. Yeah. 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 I wonder if my middle school teacher tricked me because I wanted to play trumpet, but they went alphabetical. So when they got to Tucker, there were no more trumpets. So he said, I'll just play the trombone for now and eventually uh -huh. you can switch to trumpet. And then I started playing trombone and I guess, I guess I was kind of natural at it, but he was like, no, you're a natural on the trombone. Like you should yeah. stick there. Now, I don't know if he did that to just kind of trick me to not switching the trumpet because he needed uh -huh. trombone players. But you know, it, yeah, you know, you know, you know, I think most of the band directors would do that. You know, yeah, when, right. they, when they, when they wanted a student on a particular instrument, they, they would, they would use those tactics. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, good on him. I'm glad he did it because it, yeah. it was the right choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as, as you started to, uh, uh, to get into music a little bit more, were there any African-American teachers that played an influence on you that might have inspired you to say, hey, maybe I want to do this for a living? Um, well, I got to say it was, it was my Uncle Don. Hmm. Yeah, my Uncle Don, because, uh, well, he had, he had long stopped playing, um, you know, because he used to play around the Beaumont, Texas, Port Arthur, Texas areas. Uh, but he would tell me all these stories about his gigs. Uh, mm -hmm. Uncle Don actually did, did a few records. Uh, he had a funk band uh, in, oh, okay. uh, uh, during that time, and uh, he had written a tune that had become a hit called "Don's Dream." Okay, uh, I got I got to get a copy of that from my aunt. She, she's the only I think she's the only one that has a, has a copy of that forty five. Oh wow! But um, yeah, um, I think it was just hearing his stories uh, of you know playing playing locally, and and uh, you know Uncle Don would often talk about chords and scales. You know, this theoretical talk that fascinated me, you um, know, you know, as a young kid, you hear seven chords and suspensions and it's like, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to learn chromaticism. What is that? What is that all about? <laughs> wow. Wow. So yeah, he was, the, he was the first one to spark my, spark my curiosity about playing. Okay. Um, I also had an uncle, um, my mom, um, uh, like I said, they all grew up in foster homes. So, uh, uh, Uncle Alton Dent Denson, okay. uh, who my mom was close with, uh, they had a record collection. And I'll never forget, this is uh, Hurricane Alicia back in the 80s. Uh, he had lost a lot of his records in a flood, but uh, mm -hmm. he managed to managed to save a few of them. Yeah. And uh, so he actually gave me his old stack of records. Uh. Yeah, and, 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 and that collection was Chico Hamilton and Lou Donaldson, uh, Thelonious Monk. Um, you know, there was, there was a bunch of organ uh, mm -hmm. records, Charles Earl and, and those kind of guys. Uh -huh. So that, that was, a, that was another level, another layer of exposure for me. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. That's, uh, that's interesting that, that, uh, your uncles played a big part, you know, in, in introducing you to stuff because like nobody in my family played music. Uh, I had one cousin that played a little piano, but otherwise yeah. I was like a lone horse. You know, my dad had, a couple of records. There was a couple of like Ray Charles things in there, but there was nobody that was really like deep into it until I met my uncle Earl, who at the time uh, we're making this video, he just passed away yesterday. Um, oh, unfortunately, so sorry. Um, sorry. but he, he was a cat that looked, thank you. He was a cat that looked out for, uh, me when I first moved to New York. Um, and he actually knew a lot about jazz. He was like, you know, Sonny Rollins is a Jamaican cat. He had a heavy Jamaican accent. So, you know, yeah. Sonny Rollins, you know, this guy, you know, this guy. And he actually was the person that hit me to Don Drummond. Who a a yeah. lot of people might not know about know, Don Drummond. Man, a lot of people do not know. They sleep on him. I, found yeah. his, I, I was in France uh, with Jazz and Lincoln Center. Uh-huh. Uh, I'll never forget. I think it was Toulouse. 
Toulouse, France. Uh-huh. And um, ended up going to this market, this kind, kind of outdoor market, and, you know, where they sell things, flea market, if you will. Uh-huh. And uh, there was a booth where the guy was selling records. And uh, I saw a number of Don Drummond's recordings. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I found out found out about him through Larry McClellan. I don't know if you know him. He's another one I want to recommend for, for the show. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Larry, Larry worked at, uh, he was on faculty at Berkeley for, for many years. Okay. Great trombone player, but he was the one that kind of pulled my coattail about Don Drummond. But okay, I, yeah. I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to veer off. Yeah, yeah, no, man, because my I, I didn't know much about him, and a lot of people don't know a lot about him. Don Drummond, he he was like the JJ Johnson of Jamaica. <laughs> you know, they say even JJ would fly down there to check him out, and he oh, was man. a cat that was like very responsible for a lot of the horn parts that you hear in ska and reggae music. Was this cat Don Drummond? So yeah. my uncle told me this story about a house party that he was at. Who knows whether this is true or not, but it was a good story. Um, yeah. <laughs> a house party that he was at, and Don Drummond was like down the street playing his trombone, you know, and people heard that. So people left the party and uh-huh. went and joined him down the street. And then he walked everybody back into the party while he was playing. Oh. And he was like, by the time he hit the stage and Man. was playing, it was just like nuts, you know. Um, all these, oh. cra- this is crazy legend, but you know, rest in peace, Uncle Earl, you know, yeah. and for, you know, being the uncle that like was always had some cassette tapes in his car and like, you know, check uh-huh. this out, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's, that, that is so cool. That's, that's a great story about Don Drummond. I, I'm surprised he, pr- surprised they haven't done a book or, or, in, or a documentary on him. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a book um, about yeah. him. I think there is a book that I definitely got to pick up. Um, oh, okay. But yeah. yeah, that that uncle connection, you know, made me, made me think of that because yeah. our influences come from so many different angles. <laughs> yeah, and I do got to trace back, uh, you know, my father, Oh, well, and, and, um, you know, aunts and uncles, they, they were, they were big influences on me. Uh, in addition to that, we had cousins, you know, so there, there was an extended Hayward singers, you know, through okay. my cousins and, and, and watching them in church, my cousin Shannon and Faye and, um, my cousin Troy Hayward, he played, played, played in my uncle's church as minister of music for years. Okay. Uh, he's, he's been gone for a few years now, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, just watching, watching them in church, that, that was, that, that played a big influence on my, on my, uh, uh, musical development. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I hear yeah. that when you play, you know, you hear that that gospel, that church influence in, in your trombone playing, which like, yeah. thank God for that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't help it, man. It, it just comes out. <laughs> oh, man. It's, I'm glad it's in there. <laughs> you know, a lot, <laughs> a lot of people don't get it in there. So as you as you started to take, you know, some of this education on to uh, to college and to to higher learning. What uh, what were some of the teachers that maybe that you had that that played an influence on you? Oh man, um, well you know let's let's even let's go back to high school. Okay, because uh, I had some had many great band directors. Um, okay, uh, even starting back to my middle school director, I, um, Leon Schreiber was my director uh, my first year in band. Uh-huh. And he had already you know already been he was already at retirement age. So he uh, retired my seventh grade year. Okay. And uh, a guy by the name of Bob O'Neill, uh, who played lead trumpet for Maynard Ferguson, uh, uh, okay. was our band director uh, for the remaining uh, years at, in middle school. And um, Mr. O'Neill was the one that uh, exposed me to harmony. Hmm. I'll never forget, he was teaching me the blues scales and the pentatonics and the, the mixolydian scales through Dan Hurley's book. Uh, okay. scales for jazz improvisation. Okay. And, uh, you know, he, he let me, let me hear a bunch of, uh, Maynard recordings and, and uh, you know, so there was some recordings of Maynard, even some records of Maynard playing trombone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that, um, uh, really opened my ears up to the music. Um, uh-huh. high school, I went to, uh, high school for performing and visual arts, uh, the abbrevi- abbreviation HSPVA. Okay. And, um, so, you know, uh, there's, a we had a wonderful jazz band director, Bob Morgan. Uh, he okay. goes by the name of Doc. Doc is like okay. one of the, he's still one of the prolific educators, although he's retired. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, big influence in, in the world of jazz education. So in being in that environment, that arts school, uh, where you get a chance to participate in wind ensemble, yeah. symphony orchestra, jazz ensemble, uh, was a, uh, 
big deal, quite yeah. quite a, quite a, quite an ordeal for me, and it was just very over. It was overwhelming, intimidating, and exciting at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, you coming coming from middle school from just playing football, pep music, uh, right. you know, concert band music to this environment, yeah. and uh, so you you had to get it together quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, who were who were some of the uh, other students that were in school with you at the time that maybe kind well, of pushed you? Yeah, well, at the time, uh, these are names that you know you would know. Chris Dave, uh, okay, went to, also went to that school. Uh, I'm not sure if you know of um, anyone, uh, David Detweiler, who's uh, now teaching over at Florida State. You know, okay. uh, he's he's a great great tenor player. Mm -hmm. um, I was just trying to think of names that you that you <clears throat> that you might recognize. Sure, sure. Um, uh, yeah, Chris Day would probably be, be the most most household name. Mark Simmons, great okay. drummer. Yeah, okay. yeah. He also also right. went to that school as well. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. Eric Harlan, <laughs> who's my cousin, uh, went to that school, but it was much later. Okay, dig it, yeah. dig it, <laughs> dig it. Now, as you uh, kind of went on and, and started. Uh, becoming a professional performer, um, you came up in the, I would say like the real jazz university, you worked with the queen, uh, Betty Carter. Um, could you tell the people, I mean, people that don't know, <laughs> you know, should know this, <laughs> Betty Carter bred like some of the most amazing musicians at a time that it was kind of a transition in jazz and jazz used to learn through all these different institutions. You would play in a band for a long period of time. You would learn from the people that have done it before you, you know, mm -hmm. as education and school came along, some of that stuff got lost, but oh, Betty sure. Carter was like jazz school, real life school, university, yeah. life university um, yeah. with her being a black woman and being the amazing musician she was, what kind of influence did that have on you coming up as a young African American trombonist? Woo, man, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, I I truly miss Betty. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she 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 was a big, played a major role in my life, almost like like an aunt, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I met Betty at um, International Association of Jazz Educators. This is when IAJE was still around. Uh, I want to say 1993. Uh, it was in San Antonio, and at that time, Betty was just starting her program, her nonprofit Jazz Ahead, uh, at the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and she was at, at the conference, um, uh, in essence, recruiting mm -hmm. uh, musicians. So you, you've been in those conferences where you know, you know, yeah. that after after the day, the day is over, a lot of the young musicians would get together in the conference room and jam. Yep. So Betty was hanging out at these jam sessions, and um, I just happened to happened to be there uh, at the right time, mm -hmm. and uh, got done playing. And her manager, Aura Harris, approached me and you know was praising me and as, asking if I wanted to participate in this jazz ahead program. And I excitedly accepted. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was that was just a yeah I couldn't even believe it you know. Wow. Uh, um, so yeah, months um, months after that IJE, uh, I'm gonna say this is maybe the month of April, uh, the sp in the spring. Um, I'm in New York uh, with twenty other, twenty other musicians. Be Betty puts us up at the uh, Excelsior Hotel, so okay. it's all of all of us in 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 one hotel, talking music, practicing, okay. like minds, you know. Uh, so we uh, in this program for a whole week at Brooklyn Academy of Music. And um, I'll never forget that fir that very first jazz he had. We had people like Marcus Printup, mm -hmm. Cyrus Chestnut, Jackie Terrison, <laughs> Teodros Avery, wow. Melvin Butler. I mean, it was just a whole host, of, Matt Garrison, a whole host wow. of cats. Wow. Pep, I, I don't know if you knew Pevin Everett. He was a great trumpet yeah. player. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so man, you talk about scared. <laughs> Betty, Betty had a way of just getting right in your face and and telling you what what what's needed, mm. and she she didn't she didn't hold back. Yeah, she didn't hold back at all. Um, you know, we we were required required to compose, so everybody has has you know to um, uh, present their compositions. Uh, so by the end of the week, end of the week, we have a program, we have a show to do. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, you, you uh, man, you're talking about being under the fire. That that was uh, a great experience. Yeah. Um, technically, you're only supposed to do jazz ahead once, but I think it was because Betty had a shortage of trombone players. I I, I was able to participate uh, in jazz ahead for five years up up until her passing. Okay. Wow. Uh, which wow. which was very good. Um, I never had a chance to ex extensively tour with her. Mm. Uh, but I, you know, I'm gonna do spot dates with her. I did the Chicago Jazz Festival. Yeah. I did her record. I did her last record. Yeah. I'm yours, your mine. Yeah. Um, this is back in 1996. Um, also did um, a, a week at Yoshi's with her in, in Oakland. Hmm. And uh, okay. so that, that was that was. Uh, and then the, the very last Jazz Ahead, which was uh, held at Kennedy Center uh, in 1998. Hmm. That, that was that was the last time I saw her. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What, what was it like being on stage with her? Like, but I mean, for the people that grew up with black mothers, you understand what the <laughs> black woman can commit. You understand that type of respect. You understand what those looks and, and all of that. Are. But what was that like on stage as a musician? Oh man, man. You talk, talk about terrifying. <laughs> terrifying and 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 exciting at the same time um but more terrifying than anything because yeah. <laughs> betty's listening she's listening to everything she i mean she, yeah. don't, she don't miss anything yeah I, I, I never forget um we were yoshi's and she had called uh called um something one, one of her one of her originals in at very breakneck speed mm. And I'm like, man, I'm holding on for dear life. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. But she she just had a way of, um, of of telling you the right things on the spot, and yeah. it's sometimes in front of the audience. You're right. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't get it together by then, then you're you're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never, never forget. Uh, she she got on my case about. Um, we were in the, in the jazz ahead rehearsal, and I'm, I'm reading one of the uh, one of the guys' uh, compositions, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to ear my way through it through the changes. Okay, and it got right up in the stand, and she pointed, "Look at those changes! Read those! You got to think! Look at those changes! You can't just hear! You just can't ooh, hear!" Ooh. I was like, "Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, hey, thanks, Betty. Oh, <laughs> <Lord>. appreciate it." <laughs> I got another funny. I got another funny story. Please, please. I got a couple, couple of stories. Please. <laughs> so I'm in New York. Uh, you know, I call myself trying to make it in New York. Uh huh. This is like the like the mid the mid nineties. You know, ninety uh, four, ninety five. Okay. okay. I think I think I, I, well, I was I was there. I think I'd just done a gig with Roy Hargrove, one of the big a big man thing. Uh huh. And uh, so I'm here. I, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try to try to stay here for a while. So luckily, um, Tim Williams, you know Tim, Bone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bone and Derek Gardner had an apartment in Bed-Stuy. Okay. So uh, a loft. It was an extra loft space, so they, they allowed me to stay there. Okay. Uh, I was really getting away with murder, you know, living rent-free. <laughs> Thank God for them. <laughs> hey, man, we all need some help. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, I got to a point where I ran out of money because, you know, I was basically just hanging out at Smalls and, you know, trying to, trying to find a key what was happening at Vigioni's and all these other right, venues. Right. <laughs> so I called Betty up in a pinch. Hey, Betty, uh, I, you know, hate to bother you, but, um, you know, I was wondering if I could borrow a few dollars and then I can pay you back. I, think I, I did have a gig coming up and then I was gonna, was able to give it back to her. Uh -huh. And she said, oh, you're running out of money, huh? Uh, you know, why don't you come over? So I get over there. You know, I think she's going to do the motherly you know, the aunt, the favorite, right. aunt, the favorite aunt thing. All right. So I get over there, there's a toolbox sitting on the steps. <laughs> with paint, with paint brushes and paint scrapers. Uh, oh, she went there. So for me to get this $50, I had to, I had to paint her, I had to paint her fence, her front fence and, and the back fence. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to scrape the paint and re and then repaint again. Oh man, she gave you that Mr. Miyagi love. Yeah, she gave it Mr. Miyagi. Like, Daniel shine the floor. Yeah, shine right, the floor. Right. <laughs> no, it's good for your slide technique. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> 
I know. <laughs> and then at the at the end of that, yeah, I think Betty had cooked dinner and and she had uh, asked if I wanted to eat and and then uh, after I got done working, see, this is jazz. <laughs> <laughs> you want, if you want to make money, you got to work for it. Yeah, wow. That, that was that was the, that was the greatest lesson, man. Wow, wow. That's that's <laughs> deep, though, man. It's deep because, like, yeah, we we don't think about, it, especially like at the time we're taping this, we're dealing with this whole pandemic thing where a lot yeah. of us have had to reinvent ourselves, you know, um, and and do things that we might not have thought we we're going to do or we're good at and when you look back in history you know to our heroes they were always doing stuff outside of music that we wouldn't think like you know jj worked at like a printing press you know for something i think it was for like microscopes or gyroscopes or something like that yeah i I wouldn't associate that with jj johnson (laughs) you know much like Exactly. People might not, not associate fence painting with you, but yeah. <laughs> you, uh-huh. you know, now we know. You got to work. Now for we know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, you know, and it just it just reminded me of uh, the work that I used to do with my father. You know, because my mm. father's a, just a genius of, at all, all things hands on uh-huh. technical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He had a TV shop for years, so I, you know I'm working this in, in the shop. You know, gotcha. Um, actually, uh, Trump owners Mitch Butler and I shared to kind of share a similar story because his, his dad was a TV repairman in, oh, wow. uh, North, in North Carolina. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So, wow. so I was I was used to that, I, but I, I mean I'm thinking I'm going to get like a like a free fifty dollars. Right. Uh, it wouldn't happen. Uh, no, it's old school. Old school. <laughs> one, one, uh, other, one other story I got to tell before before we go. I, I don't. I, um, where where uh, this is IJE in New York. Uh huh. And uh, I was still living in Houston at the time and struggling, not really working. Okay. And uh, I was a little frustrated with my career at that at that time. Hmm. So I'll never forget. You know, the jam session was at Birdland. Okay. You know, some of some of everybody was hanging out. I think uh, Alvester Garnett and Ruben Rogers and Donald Harris. I think Ru- Do- Duck Duck was running the session. Donald Harris. Okay. Okay. So uh, Betty sitting. Betty and Aura sitting in, uh, at a table at a booth, and I come to Betty like you know I'm just gonna you know get some motherly advice, mm. and I tell Betty I said Betty I'm really thinking about quitting music. Hmm. And uh, just getting a regular job because you know I can't seem to be can't seem to get enough gigs, mm. and uh, just thinking about getting out of the business completely. Uh-huh. What did I say that for? All right. <laughs> and she laid into me, "You coward! I can't believe you said that." <laughs> and other, other expli- expli- right. expli- explicit language. But <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Right, I mean, right. I mean she, just, she just cursed me out the whole night. Wow, she was so upset. She was in tears. Wow, and she got up. She got up from Bur- she got up from the club and went got in the cab and went home. Hmm. Wow. Oh, wow. like I just I, 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 my uh, whole face dropped. I just yeah, I like, yeah. No, I can't believe I embarrassed myself this way. All right, you're like, well, can't quit now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you coward! I can't believe it. What are you doing? Yeah, well, you know, you know, I I worked I worked all my life to try to build a career and. And here you are talking about quitting. Yeah. Man, so that's deep. That, after that night, I called her the next day. She tried to try to try to apologize. She hung up in my face the first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, called, wow. I waited. I waited a few, waited a few hours. Right. Called her back. <laughs> so she she gave gave me a nice motherly lecture. After yeah. that, you know, yeah. Don't you ever think of quitting? Don't you? Don't you give up like that? And you know, you wow. got you got to stay in. You got to stay in the game. You know. Wow. Wow. And um, I'll never forget. Um, after that final jazz ahead, this is the last time I seen a, a Betty in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, she had mail, sent me a letter in the mail, uh. and I, I got to find because uh, I, I got some things in storage at my sister's place. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was this letter, you know, thanking me for participating in Jazz Ahead and and asking me asking me to vow to never quit again. Wow, wow! I got to get that. I got to get that. Wow, letter. Yeah. wow! That's heavy, man. That's mm-hmm. wow. That I, I I think so much of that, and and I was talking with some some other guests about this. Is that sometimes you know the generation before us they they see something in us that we don't. Right. You know, and 
the the thoughts that we have don't fit with the reality based off of what they seen because everything that they've been through to get to where they are yeah. You know, for us to even think about not spreading our gift is like an insult to them. <laughs> you know, like, oh, like sure. I had to walk in the back door for you yeah. to be able to do this. And <laughs> now you don't want to do it, you know. Yeah. Um, right. And and having that is it's such an important thing, especially as an African-American male. Yeah. You know, we sometimes might not have a full family unit that we come from. And, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, it really takes a village, you know, so a lot of times the jazz community is like our village and we have people that help lift us up. You know, if family is not there, what it becomes family, you yeah. know, um, right. and, and everything that you said just reminds me so much of that and people who have, have been on me, you know, like you better, Tim was one of those people actually. Um, oh, but, oh, Bone, Bone was another yeah, one, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he was one of- Well, he's, he, was, he was like a like an uncle to me and, and Derek, mm -hmm. as well as, well, Derek, Bone was, the, Bone was the uncle, Derek Gardner was the big brother. Okay. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I met Vince, of course, Vince and Gardner later. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, those guys really looked out for me. But yeah, but Bone was, uh, one, he didn't hold back either. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, <laughs> I think it was the first Frank Foster rehearsal I ever did, or I wasn't even supposed to do it. Like Vince uh -huh. had another gig and he was like, man, just come. I got to leave early and you can yeah. sit in on the rehearsal. So I did. And and Bones had a solo on a blues and he was like, man, you take the solo. And here uh -huh. I am, this young kid. And I was like, no, nah, man, it's cool. It's your solo. You got it. And he was yeah. like, man, you know, he was a big cat, you know, um, and he yeah. was like, no, man, take the solo. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I, and I yeah. played, but it was all coming from love because he was like, look, man, this is your chance. Like, yeah. you know, might never hear you again. Like, play, play the yeah. solo, you know? Oh, and yeah. That, yeah. That's that's true, man. And you were a person that was like that for me. You know, I can I, I'm gonna tell a little bit of our history. You know, I think the first time that we really hung out was in um aspen at jazz snow mass there was yeah. i feel like it was maybe somewhere around 2001 2002 somewhere in there you know and, you know actually you know dion um to be i think it was actually 98 was it 98 man it was 98 we go way back. <laughs> we go way so back. Scratch all that. It was yeah, 98. Yeah. It was 98. Yeah, that was 98. That's, that's unbelievable, yeah. man. Isn't that crazy? Because that, 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 that section, that trombone section was me, you, and Perryman. Uh, it was me, you, it was Paul Olenek. Olenek and, was, and Nick. And Vincent, Vincent Chandler. Vincent Chandler, that's the one. Now, okay, that's yeah, the second. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. I, I, did, I did it a second year. Okay. And, uh, uh, Perryman. Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, Tim. Tim. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, Nick, Nick Vainas. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. year we did it, it was me, you, and Vincent, and Paul. And I remember just like, man, all of these guys are so much better than me. <laughs> like, oh, I remember talking about? <laughs> that at that time, man. But it, it, it was a true like brother, you know, bond that was formed, you know, from that point that carried on to yeah. even when you were in uh, New York and you were working with jazz at Lincoln Center. Yeah. And I, I used to, you know, I was still a kid at that time. And I used to go by and hang out at these rehearsals. And yeah. I remember a rehearsal that you guys did. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jazz at Lincoln Center rehearsals can be kind of long. They can be from like 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. You know, yeah. sometimes they're long work days. But mm -hmm. after the rehearsal, um, somehow I convinced you to come to Brooklyn <laughs> to my place. And yeah. we hung out after that rehearsal and played tunes like all night. Yeah, at, at my place in Brooklyn. Oh and man, I, yeah. man, I remember yeah. that so uh -huh. well. First of all, like you coming and hanging was like a big deal, but kicking uh -huh. my butt musically was a big deal. But I go back to those shed sessions. You know, I've had situations like that with Vince Gardner, with yourself, and yeah. like sharing that knowledge. You know, and just everything was such a big part of my development i don't know if you knew at the time you know what a big deal it was but well it really well, was 
wow, Dion, because you know, man, you always played so great. Um, it was just yeah. just a joy to hang out with you. <laughs> and um, you know, yeah, and I remember you know vividly those moments uh, in Aspen. You know, we 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 had a, you cut our you were the, you were our resident barber. <laughs> you yeah. me of that man. yeah yeah well, yeah man i, I uh, did what i could at the time yeah no you, you did a great job too oh, um man. but uh yeah man you know we we have well yeah we had some moments there too you know just all of us all of us jamming you know after after the uh the day was over yeah and man. um yeah i do i do remember that that night that that uh at, in brooklyn we were hanging out and yeah yeah, yeah that was that was a lot of fun but uh, you know, gosh, man, I, I never, uh, never, I, I just, I, I never viewed you as, you as a kind of student, kind of <laughs> that that student uh, mentor kind of thing. I, I, it was yeah, always yeah. like, man, he's a great, great young player, <laughs> and, and, and you know, fabulous, great to hear, always good to hear you play, and you know, nothing but soul coming out of that out of, out of your. Uh -huh. Man, and I learned all of that from you cats, you know, it was uh, such a big inspiration. And I think people should realize how important it is to have that step. Yeah. You know, when I moved to New York, I was looking at cats like yourself, Vincent Gardner, Wycliffe Gordon, Ron Westray. I knew you were like a generation ahead of me, but I watched the moves, you know, and how you moved and who you learned from and how uh -huh. you learned you know mm. it wasn't just enough to say hey go check out this record it's like yeah. no we're gonna play yeah. you know and we're, uh -huh. we're gonna sit in front of each other and we're gonna i'm gonna try to mirror what it is that you're doing well <laughs> you man I, I i tell you you know i guess i guess if, if anything it's a, it's a pass the torch kind of thing because you know slide used to do that with me hmm. slide was so gracious man he would let me come by come by and visit with him yeah. And uh, we would just play tune after tune. Yeah. Um, you know, there was some some moments, um, you know, where we would just go go through the keys hmm. and slide. Slide wouldn't tell you how to play. It wouldn't, 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 it wouldn't be a, it was never a formal lesson, although I yeah. wanted wanted it to be. Right. Uh, but he, it, uh, it was uh, slide would have a way of giving you a look. His eyes, eyes would just bulge. Hmm. You know, he would <laughs> be laser targeted on you. Like if, if he's if it's something that he's playing. Yeah, that he want that he wants you to deal with. Yeah, then, then you just I just I just knew his clues. I knew I knew that was yeah. over. Man, yeah, man, I knew that I knew that look. We were uh, this yeah. was like in the last couple of years. I, I got a chance to go over to his place and shed with him, and we were shedding on some D flat blues. Yeah, and he was just like looking at me the whole time. And uh, it, I was it, like, it, oh, it's, God. It's, that, it's, that, it's, it's, it's what they, it's what they call the Benny Goodman Ray. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Benny Goodman had a way of, uh, you know, staring at his band members when, when yeah. something wasn't right. <laughs> Man, and, and and he was he was dialed in, and, and and I'm just I'm playing, and I'm like, please, you know, just like make sure all these notes are in the key, you know, like slide. Uh -huh. But afterwards, he was like, sound good in D flat, <laughs> you know, and I was like. Oh, they got <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. zoned in though, man. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's, he's, uh, he's such an inspiration as far as, like you said, just you have yeah. to, uh, and I've, I've learned this a little bit from like how we learn our yeah. mirror neurons are so strong, you know, and what mm -hmm. we see, we imitate it. That's something that we can't avoid. So yeah. we have to pass the torch like this. Hence, once again, why this series is so important. You know, because yes. I feel like this is going to be passed on to the next generation of cats. Oh man, I'm 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 so excited that you that you created this series. Of, well, the Chop Shop is one thing. Um, you know, all the invaluable lessons that you that you that you're posting um, man, you know, on a regular you. basis. And yeah, this this Black Trom Trombone Chronicles is very important because uh, I um, for a long time I often often felt like. Um, not enough of us jazz trombonists as well as uh, the trombonists in the orchest orchestral world knew, uh, of color yeah. uh, knew each other. So this yeah. this is how we bridge that gap and make make the connection. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I fully yeah. agree. I fully mm -hmm. agree. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what what advice would you give to uh, up and coming trombone African American trombonists that? You know, maybe might be looking to us. <laughs> you know, as the the person that's bridging that gap for them, you know, what kind of things could you advice could you give them to navigate their way through? I mean, you came up 
through the jazz ahead, you know, you're around cats like Roy Hargrove, you know, like, uh-huh. you know, you learned a certain way. What type of advice can you pass on to the next generation? Well, you know, the first thing is, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I would say, that, you know, study the trombone. You become become a, become a, a devout student of the horn. Um, just because you're playing a certain genre, jazz or commercial doesn't mean that 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 your technique or your facility on the instrument should just go loose um you know the, the same techniques that we learn out of method books all also apply to improvisation and in and, and on, uh, ensemble playing in a jazz context mm-hmm. so yeah i was saying you know just commit commit to becoming uh, a scientist of, of, of the instrument mm-hmm. the other thing is um studying the lineage uh, the, the the lineage of, of trombone. Uh, I'm not not just speaking about uh, jazz music or pop music necessarily, but all of the literature associated with trombone. Because we you know we got to go back to Bach and and Chopin and all, all of these. Well, all the great trombonists, uh, uh, the uh, Arthur Priors and and the uh, the Christian Lindberghs and and, the, and those people. Um, yeah. So you know don't, don't, you know listen to everything. Yeah. Keep you keep your keep your ears open. Um keep your eyes in the books. Because mm-hmm. uh, you know, oftentimes we we're not we're not playing gigs where, uh where we have to improvise every time. You know, you know, a lot a lot of these situations could be studio, um big band, orchestral, uh commercial mm-hmm. broad broad Broadway musicals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, you know, stay in the method books for sure. Yeah. Uh, there's really no short, no no shortcuts to playing this music at all, uh, because we still 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 got to work on the on the on the techniques and uh, you know try to uh, gain as much facility to create as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely something I learned from you. I can hear yeah. some of those method exercises that you used to play. And uh-huh. I just, I'd quietly go home and practice them on my own, but I know how they're supposed to sound. Cause I heard yeah. you too, uh-huh. Uh-huh. You, you know, but uh, that's all of that is so important. And I think, I think the, a big thing that young musicians don't realize is how, once you have those exercises down, how you can use them for your own. You oh, know, sure. I've, I've yeah. seen certain videos that you've made that have been so inspiring, just like, Hey, I'm warming up in the key of G flat and I'm just playing slowly, you know, and I'm just like, it's out of time, but I'm just, you're allowing yourself to, you know, work on something, you know, it doesn't have to be the certain way out of the method book, taking it and creating your own method is something that you're fantastic at. Yeah, sure. You, you know, you make up, you make up things and, um, I hope this is this isn't too loud. I got to get my gain all the way up. Yeah, you're you're good. Yeah, oh, that's good. Okay. You know, I'll get a I'll get a treat. So I take take that same exercise, play it play it in a minor key. So it gives mm. me a chance to work on my minor modes. You're right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All minute sounds, whole tone. Mm-hmm. Or super low grade, uh, have uh, what, what do they call it? Diminished whole tone scale. can be used in some way this is vocabulary yeah yeah and there's thousands of exercises you know so when one says a young student says i'm tired of practicing scales that's that's ridiculous yeah <laughs> there's, there's, yeah there's, there's so many so many ways to ways to break up a scale yeah 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 <clears throat> you're so right about that man and yeah. <laughs> and all of you thank you for that trombone lesson all you trombonists out there that will be 8.95 <laughs> extra on top of this video <laughs> 
We took no, man. Point two. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that works right now. That yeah, works. Yeah, All right. the proceeds go to our teacher here. <laughs> oh no, man. That's that's amazing. What uh let me ask you one more question before I let you go. Um yeah. there's been like like we had a summer in 2020. Well, 2020 was just a year, period, you know, that most of us want to forget, but there was a lot there when we go back and unpack it. Yeah. Um, I know it was a, a heavy year, not just because of COVID-19, but because of a lot of what was going on with the uh, social injustice across the country. Um, I know that sparked me as a musician to yeah. kind of approach things a little bit differently, um, starting series, making sure I'm doing what I can, you know, um, to, to do my part and making sure our people are heard. What kind of things have, have you been inspired to do um, in the last year or so, musical projects that help you kind of cope with everything that's going on as a black man? Um, well, you know, actually just, just last night, um, um, I did a, a show uh, it was a virtual show for um, uh, a rabbi here, uh, Neil Blumoff. Okay. And uh, we just, uh, it was an uh, MLK ce celebration. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a bunch of us uh, together. Uh, Brandon Temple. Um, I don't know if you met Brandon when you were here. No, I didn't mean. Okay. Mike Malone uh, on saxophone and uh, great, wonderful young bass player, Jimmy Blazer. Okay. And uh, there was a percussionist uh, who's uh, actually uh, a classmate of Brandon's that, that, that was with us last night. So, uh, man, that was a beautiful time. And, you know, we, we were able to, able to, to uh, kind of ring in um, MLK's uh, birthday celebration. Um, and it's all, always, always nice when, you know, a group of us uh, um, African-American musicians here in the Austin area are together. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that can sometimes be a challenge. Yeah, in a lot of ways. So yeah. uh, you know, when that happens, it's a, it's all, always beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, I uh, you know those, those are the things that I think we we should really we should celebrate our pioneers, uh, and the ones that have paved the way for us to have certain degrees of freedoms in in, in this country. Yeah. And um, as to to what what is going on today, um, to be honest with you, <clears throat> you know, I'm very disheartened, saddened. At the same time, not shocked because, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the racism, white supremacy uh, has always been here. Yeah. And um, I just think uh, uh, with our people, if we, if we get into a, 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 a mindset of that, that this, all of this, all of a sudden, all of this has gone away simply because we have certain freedoms or we can interact with, with other, other races in public settings, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily that's a, somewhat delusional if you will yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have to we have to see the thing for what it is at the same time we as musicians are one that uh, can uh, bind things together and that's it's right. gonna it's gonna take us doing more of these pro this type of programming via podcast uh, performances to to keep the to spread the love and joy yeah as um, you know we have so many of our other Counterpart, racial counterparts who are playing this music and we still have to interact with them. Yeah. And uh, in general, as a whole, I say, be friend, be, be friend who those who want to be friendly mm -hmm. and those that, those that choose hate and, and prejudice that, uh, that that's, that, that's between them and their creator. Yeah. 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 But I think, I think it's up to us musicians to, to stay centered and, and uh, you know, we continue moving forward, spreading the spread and love and love and joy of this music. And that's yeah, that. Man. That's how. That's how we impact lives. That 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 is our that is our role. That's right. You know, a lot of people think minister. Uh, the, the the term minister is, is limited to to the church. No, yeah. minister minister is someone that that is that's willing to go out and do something when they don't nece necessarily want to. Yeah, yeah. Go out, go out <laughs> and mentor when they, when they don't necessarily want to. It's a, it's yeah. a mission. You know. That's right. So we have to we have to think of ourselves as, as as such. Yeah, yeah, man, you. You hit on that. I, I did a clinic the other day and I was talking to yeah. some of the students about that. You know, there's certain countries yeah. you go to, you travel to in Africa. If you're a musician, you have to put clergy 
clergy. You know? oh, yeah. There you go. That's right. Uh, you know, and Min ministerial duty. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, yeah. It's the same type of thing. And I think it's so important for us to not forget that music was the original medicine. That yeah. was the first medicine. Uh -huh. And I think it's gonna be the medicine that gets us through all of this stuff it has it's gotten us this far and i uh -huh. think you know it, it's gonna you, get us you, a man, little bit further you know to add to that brandon temple uh, um, rabbi neil was just uh sending us a thread on on the how he much he enjoyed last night hmm. and uh, our, uh brandon temple is a, one of our master drummers here in town man just somebody i want you to meet in the, in the future okay. but um he just said and say he said something in this thread he said music in its purest form is prayer hmm Wow. <laughs> I just wow. thought that was deep, you know. <laughs> that is, that yeah, is, uh -huh. that is, and uh, man, that that just hit me right there because yeah. it's funny to, especially if we're wind players and stuff like that. You know, we don't realize that you know our heart is is like right above our diaphragm, so it's like so uh -huh. much of what we're breathing into this, it, it, it's all connected right there. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah, <laughs> that got me thinking. Yeah, yeah, that that one that one got me thinking this morning too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. Mm -hmm. Thank thank you so much for for sharing all of those gems. Hopefully, you know the audience out there is thinking as well. You know, yeah. um, Andre, you I, I can't thank you enough for not only playing but for sharing. Just like you. You are one of the like I said, one of the most amazing people I know. Every time I talk to you my heart and soul just fills up, <laughs> you know? Oh my and goodness. I, <laughs> I feel a little bit better. So thank you for taking your time. Man. Oh, well, well, Dion, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for creating this YouTube channel and uh, putting it, putting this series out. Uh, this is so invaluable for, for all of us. Man, uh, it, this, it's, this, this is gonna be an educational resource for, for all time. Oh man, that's, yeah. I hope so. You know, I really hope yeah. so. I'm just trying to do my part. And I want to thank all of the people who watch this video. If you want to learn more information about Andre, click the links in the description of the video. And if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, The Chop Shop. Uh, as always, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time at The Chop Shop.